All right, here we are, First and Second Thessalonians, preparing for the second coming. This is lesson number nine in the series. If you've got your Bibles, open them to Second Thessalonians chapter two. That's where we're going to be, Second Thessalonians chapter two. And we're going to ask the question and try to answer the question, who is the man of lawlessness? Have a little bit of review first, catch everybody up. So these two letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, contain two major ideas. First of all, thanksgiving for the faithfulness of this particular congregation, the perseverance of this particular young congregation in the face of adversity, and then the second you know, important sections in both of these letters uh, contain important teaching concerning the return of Jesus Christ, which for, some, for various reasons was confusing them, was causing them some you know, some uh, consternation. So the first letter to the Thessalonians contained information about the actual return of Jesus and what would happen to believers when Jesus returns. And then the second letter to the Thessalonians describes key events that must take place before the return of Jesus Christ. And I suppose this was necessary uh, necessary teaching because there were some people in that particular congregation who had begun to say that Christ had already come or that Christ's coming was imminent. It was like right away, it's just happening now and people were getting upset and so on and so forth. So Paul is teaching not only what would actually happen to Christians when Jesus returned, but also what were the things that had to happen first before he, uh, before he uh, returned. So in this second letter, Paul reassures them that the day, when he talks about the day, he's always talking about when Jesus returns, that the day had not yet come because other events had to take place first. And the other events that had to take place, one, the apostasy, the falling away of believers from the truth, that had to take place first, and the revelation of the man of lawlessness as his restraining influence is removed. All right, so we're going to talk about that today. So in our last session, we said that the falling away from the teachings of Christ had already begun. Now we're going to look at the possible identification of the man of lawlessness. Who is, you know, who could it be, this man of, of lawlessness? So let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and begin reading in verse 1. Paul writes, now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to Him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message of a letter as if from us, to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God. Do you not remember that while I was still with you, I was telling you these things? And you know what restrains him now, so that in his time he will be revealed. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Then that lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will slay with the breath of his mouth and bring to an end by the appearance of his coming. That is, the one whose coming is in accord with the activity of Satan, with all power and signs and false wonders, and with all the deception of wickedness for those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth so as to be saved. This is another one of these long passages where you say to yourself, well, I understand all the words he's saying, but when I put all the words together, I go, huh, what's he talking about? So, here he's talking about the end time will not come unless the man, unless two things happen. The apostasy takes place, the falling away from the faith. And remember, I've already explained that to you. Falling away from the faith, only Christians can fall away from the faith. Muslims cannot fall away from the faith because they don't have the faith to begin with. Atheists can't fall away from the faith because they don't believe, period. So 
uh, the apostasy is within Christianity. So you have the truth here, the gospel truth, the Bible truth, and you have people who believe that truth and live according to it. The apostasy is that those people begin to fall away from, because the truth always remains. People begin falling away from that truth within Christianity. So he says that's the first thing that has to happen before Jesus returns. And then the second thing is the man of lawlessness must be revealed, not just appear, he must be revealed. To who? Well, to Christians. We need to find out who the man of lawlessness is. Okay, so <clears throat> throughout uh, history, there have been various ideas as to, well, who is the man of lawlessness? And um, I, you know, we don't have time in one class to go over all of them, but I've picked the four main ones, the four main ideas that have come forward to describe who is this man of lawlessness. So let's look at the four main ones, all right? The first one, the Roman Empire. For a long time, people thought the Roman Empire uh, was the man of lawlessness. And it's easy to see why early Christians might think that the Roman Empire was the man of lawlessness. Roman Empire opposed Christianity. It demanded worship of the emperor as God. It promoted great evil. <clears throat> and the restraining power because Paul talks about you know, the restraining power has to be removed so that the, the man of lawlessness you know, really do a lot of evil. So the restraining power was thought to be the actual Roman government which kept the emperor's power in check and prevented his total lust for absolute power. Now this, of course, this theory falls apart because the scripture says that the man of lawlessness would be there even at the end of time and then be destroyed by the coming of Jesus. Well, we see right away why the Roman Empire can't be the man of lawlessness. The Roman Empire and the emperors of the Roman Empire are long gone, and so it cannot fulfill this portion of scripture. But it was easy to see for the first couple of hundred years how people would think, wow, this, this is the man of lawlessness, all right? Another idea, who is the man of lawlessness? A lot of people think Satan is the man of lawlessness. Some think that Satan himself is that person. He works behind the scenes you know, to create and promote evil and then one day actually becomes human in some form in order to personify the man of lawlessness. Many people have thought this is how it was going to happen. As a matter of fact, a lot of popular movies uh, have used this idea. If you're old enough to remember, you know, The Exorcist, right? You know, every movie where the devil becomes you know, a human being of some kind right, is based on this thought here that somehow the man of lawlessness is Satan. So you know, the exorcist, Damien, Rosemary's Baby, the Devil's Advocate, all these movies, they all you know, glom onto this idea and they develop it uh, in a movie. Now in this theory, the Holy Spirit, perhaps working through the word of God, this is the restraining power. Because you've got to figure out two things. Who's the man of lawlessness and what is this restraining power? So in this theory, the restraining power is the um, is the Holy Spirit working through the word. The idea is that the Holy Spirit will be removed at the end so Satan can take human form and be destroyed by Jesus before he takes over the world. So that's the theory as it's played out to its end. Now, there are some problems with this theory as well. In verse nine, Paul says that Satan is directing this person. Wait a minute. Now we, we got to have Satan directing himself. That doesn't make any sense. Satan is directing this person, this person uh, here who is going to be the man of lawlessness. But in the idea that Satan is the man of lawlessness, uh, you know, there's a contradiction. Satan is not divided. There's also no indication that the Holy Spirit is ever restrained by anyone other than an individual sinful Christian. The only person who can restrain the Holy Spirit is you and me when we say no to him. When through His word He says, do this, do that, you know, stop this, don't do this. Don't, you know, whenever we say, no, I'm going to do it anyways, well, we are restraining the Holy Spirit. We're quenching the Spirit right, in our lives. But nobody you know, holds back the, the power of the word of God. Also, no one can restrain the Holy Spirit's power working in somebody else's life. I can't stop the Spirit of God working in you. I don't have, nobody's got that power. Now in Revelation chapter 20 verses one to three, um, uh, John is writing uh, in that passage, it demonstrates that Satan is being restrained for a thousand years. 
That's not a literal one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, nine hundred and ninety-nine, a thousand, not, not literal a thousand years. A thousand years is the, the New Testament period, right? Jesus dying on the clock, uh, cross, resurrecting, the gospel is preached, clock, the clock starts all the way till today. We're still in that thousand years. That, per, that perfect period of time that only God knows when it will end, that we're in that, okay? So Revelation shows that Satan is being restrained for a thousand years and the agent of that restraining power is an angel, not the Holy Spirit. So you know, we got to go with what the scriptures say. Before the coming of Christ, Satan deceives the world with great power. After the cross and the gospel is preached, Satan's power is much diminished. Therefore, something else through Satan's remaining power and someone else manipulated by him will manifest itself. So the fact that Satan will be released suggests a great release of evil power present at the end just before Jesus returns. So the idea that Satan is the man of lawlessness has a lot of problems with it. In other words, it violates other passages of scripture and whenever you run into that problem, you don't change what the scripture says, you change your theory. And a lot of people are in love with their theories and they, you know, they don't want to do that. But anyway, that's another, another class for another time. Now one of the most popular ideas, especially in evangelical Christianity, is that the papacy, the pope and the institution of the papacy, that's the man of lawlessness. Okay? Within Christianity, the idea of the papacy within Christianity, you know, it actually fits pretty well with the activity of the apostasy and the idea of the man of lawlessness. So let's look at the pluses for this theory. Uh, as I say, it is a favorite theory of evangelicals and extreme fundamentalists. Uh, I think you heard a couple of years back, you know, Bob Jones University, remember when President Bush visited Bob Jones University and he was criticized for that. Well, he was criticized because Bob Jones University teaches this very thing here and he was criticized by his Catholic constituency, you know, the Catholic voters, because they were not pleased that he would you know, honor a, uh, this university with his presence that was teaching something so harsh against their, uh, against their faith. Um, so some of the pluses for this theory. First of all, it's within Christianity and it's very visible. Secondly, it grew out of the roots of apostasy sown in the first and second century. When I say it, I mean the papacy. Um, also, the reorganization of the New Testament church from a local autonomous pastoral system to a model of organization based on the Roman hierarchical system, which is what the papacy did, produced four changes that changed the church. First of all, it separated you know, the ministers from the laity and made them a special intermediary between God and the church, and it created a class system within the church. So we know the Bible teaches that in the New Testament church, every single member is a priest. Re uh, Revelation 1 verse 6. And every single member has a gift or a ministry. Romans chapter 12. So this biblical idea that every member a priest, every person has a ministry, this biblical idea was replaced with an elitist view of ministry by the Roman Catholic Church. The priests were here, the laity were down here, the bishops were there, the cardinals were up there. That was not the design and certainly not the pattern for the organization of the church that is described in the New Testament. Secondly, the papacy and its rear, and, and you know, don't get me wrong here, you know, I grew up Catholic, so I, you know, I, I can relate to the Catholicism uh, and I can relate to what you know, is being taught here. But we're not, we're not attacking Catholicism, we're simply describing its system. Okay? We're just describing its system. So the papacy also and its reorganization of the church gave special authority to pastors and elders over and above the local congregation and set into motion the pyramidic power system of the Roman Catholic Church today. Now the Bible gives leadership to a group of men, elders, for only one congregation. There is no authority in the church beyond the local level according to the New Testament. So we have seven elders, six, seven elders, 
And those elders are responsible as a group for this congregation, but they are not responsible for the congregation of the church that meets in Dell City or in East Side or, 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 or North Side or Edmond. They're only responsible for this congregation. And they lead as a group. No, el no one elder can you know, cross over to the Nicoma Park Church and say, well, I'm an elder and so you've got to do what I say. And, you know, the, uh, no, the New Testament does not teach that. Autonomous churches led by local leadership. That was the new system, or excuse me, that was the uh, 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 New Testament system for church uh, leadership. Uh, and that was changed uh, by the uh, papacy. Also, this reorganization under the Pope introduced new church positions and roles that were not found in scripture. Offices such as archbishop, cardinals, popes, these things were inventions of men, not authorized by scripture, which only recognizes certain roles. The only roles described in the Bible for people in the New Testament church are one, evangelists, means to proclaim. You can call an evangelist a preacher, a missionary, a minister, it's all the same thing, it all refers to the same thing. You have the role of deacon, so the evangelist, his ministry is the ministry of proclamation. That's the ministry that we have. I do it on the internet, Marty does it from the pulpit, you know what I'm saying? Everybody has a specialized area where they proclaim. Then you have the ministry of service, deacons, specialized service, individuals who are selected among the congregation and given certain specific responsibilities the ministry of service. Then you have the ministry of leadership, and we've talked about that, given to elders, selected very strict criteria for what those meant. Elders need to be married, they need to, you know, they need to manage their families well, they need to have a good reputation in and out of the church, they're not, not easily given to anger, and not drinkers, not brawlers, not you know, womanized, you know, there's a lot of things there. But, uh, elders, the ministry of leadership, and then of course uh, our elders, there are a lot of different words, just like there are different words for evangelists, you can call them a minister, you can call them a preacher, well they're the same thing for elders, you can call them a bishop, you can call them a pastor, you can call them a presbyter, you can call them an overseer, those are all different words that describe the same person. So someone might ask, well why are there different words? Because it describes different elements and different areas in an elder's work. Elder refers to the individual's maturity. Pastor means shepherd, refers to how that individual works. He's a shepherd, that's his task. Uh, overseer describes his responsibility and his authority given to him by God to oversee the work of the church. Uh, is there another one here I forgot? Uh, presbyter, part of a group. All right, so it's just like uh, me, Michael Mazzalongo, uh, well, I'm a man, but I'm also a father, and I'm also a husband, I'm also a son, I'm also a brother in Christ. You know, I have different things, but they all refer to me. In the same way, the Bible has different words, all referring to elders. So the elders have the ministry of leadership, and we also have ministry of teaching, teachers. They're not necessarily elders or deacons, but they've been given the responsibility to teach because of their skills and their uh, abilities. Those are the only ordained roles in the church. Everything else has been added by human beings. So the papacy changed the hierarchy, if you wish, and gave some people higher, higher authority than others. And then um, this reorganization Put into, uh, put into the hands of men or boards or committees the right to change, add, subtract the teachings of Christ, which is a very serious thing. Talk about apostasy. Just give you an example. Again, all I'm doing is describing a system. All right? So here, historically, some of the changes in doctrine over the years instituted by the papacy. Infant baptism, third century. The confessional, an individual going to a priest to confess their sins in the fourth century was instituted. The Bible says, who do we confess our sins to? Well, to each other. <laughs> if I sin against you, I need to go to you to confess. If I sin against God, I confess 
to God, but I don't go to the minister to confess my sins to him. He has no power to forgive me. Uh, the, minister, the, um, the doctrine of transubstantiation began in the ninth century. The idea that the bread and the wine at communion actually becomes in a miraculous way the flesh and the blood of Jesus Christ and that miracle performed through the priest and no one else, that, that idea doesn't exist in the Bible, but it was instituted in the ninth century. You know, the idea of indulgences in the 15th century. In other words, if you purchased an indulgence, it meant that you could speed through to go to heaven. Because in the Catholic system, there's heaven, there's purgatory and hell. Purgatory is like the waiting room, if you wish, all right? where there's suffering there, but it isn't eternal. You spend a certain amount of time there. Well, if you purchased an indulgence, you could skip uh, purgatory and go straight to heaven. When my dad died, remember I grew up Catholic, when my dad died, he was, a, you know, he was uh, with the mob, and uh, he, uh, he had a lot of people at his uh, funeral, and, and we counted up, there were 153,000 masses purchased for him to get him out of purgatory so he could go straight to heaven. We were impressed by, by that, you know what I'm saying? But there's nothing in the Bible. We, we often think purgatory is just waiting in line to get your license at the license bureau on 240, but <laughs> they, uh, they believed <laughs> that uh, this was the case. Um, infallibility, the big one, right? Infallibility in 1870. The doctrine where the, where, that said the Pope could not make a mistake, in other words, he was infallible uh, when speaking from the chair of Peter, ex cathedra, meaning when he spoke on behalf of the cardinals, uh, there was no second guessing. He was infallible. So that just names a couple, just a couple of things from the past. Ones perhaps you have not Grown up as Catholic, you might not be familiar with, uh, with all of these things, but most of us kind of know about these particular doctrines. The latest edition being promoted by the previous Pope is the doctrine of the co-mediatrix of Mary. <clears throat> to me, I found that especially apostate and appalling. The co-mediatrix of Mary is this. It's the idea that says that through her suffering, Mary, the mother of Jesus, contributes to the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross for our sins. That's the co-mediatrix of Mary. In other words, we're saved by the atoning work of Jesus and Mary. Yeah, yeah, enough said. In addition to these things, the papacy, as the man of lawlessness, also has other points that support this view. It claims superiority over every believer and demands obedience. It makes itself equal with God in the sense that the papacy claims infallibility in matters of teaching and condemns all those who oppose the Pope. You know, all this traveling by the Pope and shaking hands and with all different groups and so on and so forth, that's, you know, those are photo ops. Those are photo ops. You scratch the surface and go into Catholic doctrine, the Catholic doctrine states unequivocally that uh, if you're outside the Catholic Church, you are lost, period. That, that doctrine hasn't changed. The Catholic Church has consistently produced false doctrine, false miracles, elevated ordinary people to semi-godlike roles of saint in an effort to maintain rulership and credibility with its followers. And all of this done in the name of Jesus Christ. The role of the papacy is the largest and longest unbroken apostasy visible within Christianity. It's not the only one, but it's the biggest one. Now, some also think that the restraining influence, remember in the Bible, two things, you know, man of lawlessness needs to be revealed, and secondly, the re restraining power has to be removed. So some believe uh, that the papacy is the man of lawlessness. So what about the restraining? What's the restraining influence? Well, some people uh, believe the restraining influence over the papacy is the Roman Catholic Church structure which has historically fought with the papacy. A little bit like the, like the, the states versus Washington, you know, states' rights versus federal government, you know, that, 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 that arguing, that uh, you know, wrestling that continually goes on for power. 
same thing happens within the Catholic Church. Interesting historical note, the College of Bishops, you know, the College of Bishops, right, in the Catholic Church, the College of Bishops fought very hard against the introduction of the doctrine of papal infallibility in 1870, but they lost the battle. They were outvoted. Okay, so others teach that the Reformation and the resulting spread of the Bible into the hands of the common people has mortally wounded the papacy and that because of this, it no longer has the power that it once had. So what, what am I saying here? I'm saying the idea is that the Reformation was the breath of his mouth, if you wish, that God sent to strike down the man of lawlessness, which is the papacy. That's how, that, you know, that's how this thinking works here. And only the return of Jesus is left to completely discredit and destroy this institution. Again, I'm simply repeating what some scholars have thought uh, concerning the Catholic Church and the man of lawlessness and how these two are connected. A lot of scholars hold to this particular view, which I've summarized concerning the papacy as the man of lawlessness. I mean, it's true that there are many parallels here, and it's a good argument, and it's held by a lot of people, but in our study, let's look at some of the problems with this view. First of all, the Pope does not claim deity. He only claims authority in religious matters. At the moment the Pope is trying to unite all religions and foster a greater unity between, for example, Catholics and Protestants. He, recently he was in Turkey uh, visiting uh, mosques and uh, you know, shaking hands with, uh, with uh, the many leaders in, uh, in the Muslim religion. Secondly, in 2 Thessalonians, the apostasy is such that the man of lawlessness and the system that he fosters is an open rebellion against Christ and the gospel, according to 2 Thessalonians. So whatever its mistakes, the Roman Catholic Church promotes belief in the God of the Bible, promotes faith in Christ, promotes high moral standards. You know, uh, the, the Catholic Church uh, has consistently fought against the idea of gay rights and gay marriage, you know, upholding that. The Catholic Church, uh, very solid against abortion, for example, and, and other social sins. Um, uh, you know, growing up, uh, I learned about who Jesus was through the Catholic Church. And, and I, you know, as I progressed in my religious understanding, and especially my understanding of the Bible, my understanding of who Jesus was never actually changed. In other words, in the Catholic Church, I was accurately taught who Jesus was. He was the Son of God, God made man. I didn't learn that as a member of the Church of Christ. I learned that as a, as a member of the, of the Catholic Church growing up. So you know, we have to kind of you know, uh, say what is actually true about this organization. <clears throat> In the end, you know, I believe that the Catholic system and the papacy, I believe that, uh, and it's my personal opinion, I believe that it's part of the apostasy and they suffer from the delusions and the errors brought about by the man of lawlessness. Remember, the man of lawlessness creates delusion. The man of lawlessness, you know, uh, the end result of the man of lawlessness is people falling away from Christ, falling away from the teaching. I believe the Catholic Church, if it's guilty of a sin, it's the falling away from the teachings of Christ. In other words, they are unwitting tools in the larger scheme of evil that creates confusion and heresy within Christianity. But I don't believe that they and the Pope are the, like the man of lawlessness as some people believe. You see, the apostasy is something that happens within Christianity. And, and I believe that different unbiblical forms of Christianity practiced today, which include Roman Catholicism, but also include Mormonism and Seventh-day Adventists and Jehovah Witnesses and so on and so forth. All of these things are individual parts of a general apostasy that began in the second century and continues today in ever you know, different forms. It is inaccurate, however, to say that the man of lawlessness is the head or the leader of the apostasy. That's not a biblical idea. The apostasy begins 
and it develops in many ways and then the man of lawlessness is revealed as a separate event. These are two different events, remember. Paul says first there's the apostasy, then the man of lawlessness is revealed. They're two separate events. So these are separate things happening concurrently. The Bible does not say that the man of lawlessness is a religious figure. That's the main reason why the Pope as the man of lawlessness doesn't work, because the Bible doesn't say the man of lawlessness is a religious figure. Paul says that the man of lawlessness opposes religion, opposes God, opposes worship, and tries to take God's place as ruler over men. That's what the Bible says. Although it fits in a lot of ways, the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church as the man of lawlessness does not match important facts that the Bible gives about him. Does the Roman Catholic Church fit within the idea of the apostasy? Oh yes, absolutely. I believe that. It's very easy to prove it. But is the Pope the man of lawlessness? No. Why? Because I don't want him to be? No, because it just doesn't fit what the scriptures say about him. All right, we have just a few minutes left. Let's go to the fourth view. Okay, the fourth view. The fourth view is that the man of lawlessness is a principle of lawlessness. The principle of evil and rebellion working in the world and manifesting itself in a variety of people and movements throughout history. So you see the principle of lawlessness, you see it working in the Roman Empire, in the barbarian wars, in the dark ages, in Nazism, in communism, in godless philosophy, in fanatic religious aggression. All of these things have one thing in common. They have a core of evil that's driving them. So these and other movements have tried to rule men without respect to God or the God of the Bible. Just because some guy you know, shoots you in the head saying praise God doesn't mean that he's actually praising the God of the Bible. They've used lies, power, and every evil device to achieve their goals. So all have been caught up in the power of delusion caused by atheistic philosophy or the twisted religion of every age. In every age, I'm saying, there is this principle of evil that is working in society and it manifests itself in all kinds of ways and movements and, and, and evil dictators and crazy religions and so on and so forth. For example, every age produces a new version or a face of this evil principle. Uh, the materialism in the 19th century, humanism in the 20th century, postmodernism in the 21st century, religious fanaticism of our day, all of these are just manifestations, manifestations of this principle of evil that is operating in our world. All of them have opposed God. All of them have tried to destroy true worship. All of them have tried to take God's place in His own temple. And what is the temple of God? The human being. We're the temple of God. And so the principle of evil is always trying to take us over as individuals. And this principle of evil, like yeast, working but not being seen, will continue working in this way until the evil will be embodied in one person or one movement which will be more powerful and more evil and more threatening to man's soul than ever before. The man of lawlessness will pose a threat because his revealing will be accompanied, as the Bible says, by personal claims to deity, by signs and wonders, uh, by visibility on a worldwide scope. So follow me here, this principle of evil is always working, always working, manifested in a variety of ways throughout history, but at some point it'll be manifested in such a way the most powerful of evil at some point in time will be manifested. So the understanding is that it is the man of, evil, uh, the man of lawlessness that is being revealed will be the sign that the return of Christ will be imminent. This principle of evil will finally be manifested, all right? Now remember, Jesus does not return until the man of lawlessness is revealed. And my question is always, revealed to who? Well, the answer is revealed to us, Christians. 
Disbelievers and the wicked will not recognize Him for who He is. Jesus promises that Christians will know. And the question is, well, how will we know? And the answer is, Jesus will reveal Him to us. We don't have to be afraid that we won't see it or we'll miss it or we'll sleep through it. The man of lawlessness is revealed. He doesn't reveal himself. We don't have to worry. We will know who he is. Now the restraining power, the restraining power that holds him back, you know, verses six and seven, is referred to as a person and a power and himself a mystery. This restraining power could be the opposing principle of law and order as manifested in history throughout various leaders and governments. So what's holding this principle of evil back from totally dominating? I think it's the principle of law and order in various societies. When this principle of law under which we live here in the United States, when this principle breaks down, the man of lawlessness will give full vent to his evil and only the return of Christ will be able to stop it and destroy it. So when we put these ideas together, we see a kind of a, a historical pattern emerge. God's word is preached, and from it many laws and many cultures are formed to reflect it. The principle of evil then is at work, essentially opposing God and seen in its constant attack against moral and legal standards. The apostasy begins and throughout history works to a point where there is little divine basis for laws and morals of mankind. Does this sound familiar to you? <laughs> uh, 50 years ago, could you have believed, fi fi just 50 years ago, but hundred, let's say 100 years ago, okay? 19, in 1914, you ask anybody in the U.S. of A if the President of the United States would be caught dead promoting and encouraging men to marry each other or women to marry each other. I mean, people would go, oh, stop, don't say that. You know, I can't stand it. You know? Today, it's normal. Why? Because we've had a hundred years of this principle of evil like yeast working in our society, breaking down our laws, breaking down our moral structures. I mean, you know, I'm not you know, setting my very limited hair on fire here this morning trying to make some, it's just take a look around. We always say this country was formed and based on you know, the Bible, Judeo-Christian principles, blah, blah, you know, God's word, so on and so forth. Yeah, that's history. And what has happened? Well, we've slowly but surely fallen away from all of that. Why? Well, because this principle of evil has worked. And somehow we can't, it's like an octopus, right? We can't seem to get a hold of the thing. So this removal of God's will from the fabric of human affairs and laws permits a final surge of evil which is personified in a single person or a movement that seeks to replace God and His will as the source for human values and human laws. When this happens, this will signal the return of Christ and His word to its preeminent position and destroys uh, uh, once and for all the principle of evil, the man of lawlessness, the corrupted world, the wicked and unbelievers who have served the apostasy and the principle of evil. Now I like this fourth theory to explain Paul's prophecy for a couple of reasons. First, the emperors of Rome are gone. Satan cannot be divided. The papacy fails, the complete description, if you wish, of the man of lawlessness. But the fourth theory explains the past, it explains the present, and it explains the future without violating any facts about the man of lawlessness and the apostasy as it is taught in 2 Thessalonians. So we can choose what we believe works here, but I think that this fourth theory most accurately explains most of the facts we have about this teaching. Remember I said at the beginning, there's a lot in this 30 minute lesson here, there's a lot to chew on. You know, there's a lot to chew on. This is probably one of the most complicated and difficult passages in the, in the New Testament. So what about us today? You know? Well, we live in a time when both the apostasy 
right? And the principle of evil are at work in our world and in the church. We're living in that time. So we need to do two things in response. Again, not running around thinking, oh, the end is near. We don't know. I'll know the end is near when I know who the man of lawlessness is. When I know the man of lawlessness, when, when that one is revealed, then I'll know, okay, the next thing to happen is Jesus will return. But I, remember what I told you about prophecy? You have to be careful. We know the sequence, right? But we don't know the time frame. I know that A will come before B and B will come before C, but I don't know how much distance there is between A and B and B and C. There could be two years or 200 years or 2,000 years. I, I don't, none of us know that. So, so far the man of, laws, of lawlessness has not been revealed. That's the thing that needs to happen. So what do we need to do? First of all, stay close to the word of God in all things. I think the idea of the restoration movement that birthed the churches of Christ, you know, whose appeal was let's just go back and stick to the Bible and be very careful about that, I think that that was part of the restraining that God you know, visited upon the world to restrain the evil. And then secondly, struggle against the principle of evil by preaching the gospel to this world and living holy lives in order to call the lost into the light and into the safety of Christ. Now, you know, I've talked about all this evil and all this stuff going on and it frustrates me at times, but I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. What will happen if they all take over? What will happen if you know, the Muslims come here and they destroy everything and they're in charge? That won't change what I've got to do. It'll change the way I have to do it, but it's not going to change the way I have to live and the way I have, what I have to do as a Christian man. It's going to make it more difficult for me to do it, but I have absolutely no fear that you know, I won't know what to do anymore. I know exactly what to do. I'm just thankful that I'm able to do what I do preach the gospel, live a Christian life, and I'm still able to do that in relative safety in this country, but it might not always be like that. So let's be sure and remember who we are and what we're about, and that's enough. The Lord will reveal to us in plenty of time who the man of lawlessness is and prepare us for His coming. All right, that's our lesson for today. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>